It's Tuesday, July 14th, and this is now on H&N. It really was a choice between two difficult options. The governor delays plans to restart tourism until September 1st after a surge in COVID-19 cases. The outbreaks on the mainland are not in control. Coming up, how this move is hitting the businesses already on the edge of collapse. Every time they push it back, it puts me back. From job loss to child care to mental stress, I'm Michelle Medina with the results of a study that shows how women are bearing the brunt of the pandemic. There were times when I would wait until they went to sleep, but then I'm exhausted <laughs> trying to work. New today, the NFL unveils gear to help reduce the spread of the virus. I gotta think of a, you know, a song. These stories plus Frank DeLima meets Frank DeLemer coming up on This Is Now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having lunch with us. I'm Jonathan, your director. Alongside Ashley, we got to begin to get today with another sizable uptick in numbers from the Department of Health. Hey, everyone. Health officials are reporting 22 new COVID-19 cases today. 19 of those patients are on Oahu and three are on the Big Island. That brings the statewide total to 1,264. One case was removed from the statewide count after updated data, and more than 70% of patients have recovered from their symptoms. Meanwhile, Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell says he supports the governor's decision to delay the restart of tourism. In fact, after a surge in cases on Oahu and reports of people and some businesses blatantly ignoring health and safety rules, Caldwell is asking the governor to approve new restrictions on bars and cabarets. So yesterday I sent a amended Restore Honolulu order over to the governor for his approval. I hope he'll approve it today in which we have asked for two things. One is we've asked that all bars and cabarets stop serving liquor midnight every day of the week. Right now bars can serve till 2 in the morning and cabaret till 4. And we believe that people as they hang around a bar for a long period of time and, and drink alcohol, they get more lax in their actions and therefore we have examples that we don't want to see. And hopefully the governor will grant that, that order so that we can pull back from 4 o'clock for cabarets and 2 o'clock for bars to midnight. And if that makes a difference, we stop there. But if you consider to see violations, perhaps we move as far back as 10 in the evening. Don't want to go there, but we'll be watching to see what happens in certain bars. The other thing we did in this order is we're asking for the authority in the amended order that liquor inspectors or the Honolulu Police Department can shut down a bar for 24 hours if after warning and citing they continue to violate the mandates that we put in place when we allowed bars to open up. And that again is wearing face coverings where possible, physical distancing and not being close together. The delay in reopening comes at a significant cost for tourism dependent businesses. Of course, the more money lost means the more jobs that could be lost. Chelsea Davis has more on that. If the hardest hit place in Hawaii economically is Waikiki, with several hotels completely empty right now. As much as hotel workers want to come back to work, their union says hotels aren't ready to welcome visitors back. Every time they push it back, it puts me back. Tony Tagle is a cook at Sammy's Beach Bar and Grill at the Honolulu Airport. He hasn't worked since mid-March. He says the decision delays the date he returns to work and fears he may never return at all. It's going to push me back since I'm on the bottom of the totem pole. It's probably going to push me back December, January, if, if maybe even longer. We're really struggling right now and... Um, none of our jobs are guaranteed. The USS Bofin Submarine Museum and Park just reopened last month and was looking forward to new visitors. Normally, they make about $10 million a year. So far in 2020, they've made less than $2 million and now face more layoffs. Prior to the shutdown, we were at about 50 and I'm down to less than 40 right now and I'm probably headed to less than 30. 
Waikiki's beachfront Halekulani Hotel will take the opportunity and close for one more year to do renovations and maintenance. Its sister property, the Halepuna, plans to reopen later this year. Other hotels hope the delay gives the government more time to implement better protocols. In the morning, housekeepers gather in a big room, shoulder to shoulder for their briefing. That has to change. Eric Gill with the Hotel Workers Union says employees have been given no plan for health and safety when they head back to work. You know, the number of people can get on elevators, that has to be watched. It's not appropriate to put dirty linen down a linen shoot right now. And yet that's what they're doing. He says the delay buys him time to roll out a plan as far as guidelines, training, securing personal protective equipment and acquiring more tests. So the government has to step in or those places won't work safe. And if they don't, we'll all get sick. The union is planning a caravan through Waikiki this Wednesday to get their voices heard. There are also things planned for the Big Island, Maui and Kauai that day as well. They expect more than 600 people to come out. Chelsea Davis, Hawaii News Now. Now again, the mandatory 14-day quarantine for out-of-state visitors is being extended through the end of August. With more on the blow to businesses, our Casey Lund spoke to Sherry Manor McNamara, the head of the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I just want to ask you, how much longer, first of all, do you, do you agree with pushing that date back with the governor's decision? And really, how much longer can Hawaii businesses weather this storm? In April, we surveyed our membership and the broader business community, and four out of ten businesses indicated that they cannot reopen until tourism reopens. Uh, so when the August 1st date was announced, you can imagine there was a sense of anticipation and a glimmer of hope that commerce can begin. Uh, so we've heard that many of them have started bringing back their employees, setting their business up to ensure that they follow the health and safety protocols, as well as sourcing products and services, such as food. Um, that's now that the date has been moved back to September 1st, you can imagine now it's from anticipation to anxiousness. And the reason why the August 1st uh, date was also prominent were for two reasons. One, the unemployment insurance, the federal plus up, expires at the end of July, and the PP program ends uh, at the beginning of August. So as you can imagine, many businesses are on their last lifeline. You know, many will shut down permanently. We're already seeing that. Yeah. Uh, just media alone, we count to more than 50 businesses. But if you drive through Waikiki, there's still a number of businesses that are still not open. And so, you know, we're going to see probably waves of closures if nothing is done. With that said, we understand the health and safety uh, is utmost importance for a state. Uh, we just what we are just asking for is what is the stabilization plan to ensure that businesses can continue to survive during this extremely challenging time. And really quickly, with just a little time left, Sherry, I want to ask you what the chamber is doing to support those smaller businesses, the people that are out of work because of um, these closures. Sure. First and foremost is our advocacy efforts uh, to ensure that Voices Businesses continues to elevate uh, as each day goes by. Uh, secondly, we have a 1808.org website. Uh, for those businesses that do not have an e-commerce site, please contact us. We'll be more than happy to post your product uh, for free. Uh, and then three, uh, we just we are launching a Hawaii is hiring portal for those who will be dislocated or who are dislocated, as well as recent graduates to see where the job opportunities are and where we can match them. I love that, Sherry. Thank you so much. We'll probably explore those in different stories later. I think that's a wonderful program. Again, 1808.org, correct? Yes. Very much. Sherry Minor McNamara with uh, Chamber of Commerce Hawaii. Thank you for joining us. The mayor of Kauai is reiterating he understands how close to closing some local storefronts are. My message to the business is, is it's truly heartbreaking. You know, I come from a family of grocers. We spent our lives in the grocery business. And we understand how thin that profit margin is and our ability to, to be able to stay open is highly reliant on increased customer count that visitors bring. And so we're very aware of the hardship that's being created and we're doing everything that we can to provide relief. 
Kawakami says there are concerns that the state's new target date of September 1st won't be enough of a delay to ensure the safety of Hawaii's residents. He says it is difficult to say what September is going to look like, but he realizes that the private sector needs a date in order to plan. Now I've seen the comments a lot of you on Facebook have been asking for this next update. Here's Lacey Denise with more on how the upcoming school year will look like for both UH and DOE students. The teachers union says it secured a deal with the Department of Education to keep desks and all meeting spaces at least six feet apart instead of three feet. Schools that need to set up spaces closer than that must get approval first. This is going to change how my classroom would traditionally be set up. They're not going to be in table groups and collaborating, but I'm going to be able to make sure they're safely working together. It doesn't look like grades should look, but it's what first grade will look like to keep them safe. The union says face coverings must also be worn. Both the union and the DOE plan to meet weekly to address any problems that might come up. The deal will go to the Board of Education in 10 days. Meanwhile, the University of Hawaii announced that inbound students coming to Oahu or Kauai can attend classes and university activities if they test negative shortly before or after arriving. Those who don't get testing would be required to isolate for the full 14 days. Students who are unable to get tested before arriving will not be allowed to attend school activities. For This Is Now, I'm Lacey Denise. A staggering 81% of Hawaii residents say they don't want tourists returning to their communities right now. That's according to a study by the UH Public Policy Center. This morning on Sunrise, we spoke to Colin Moore about that. First of all, was there anything in there about when people would feel comfortable having the tourists come back? We didn't ask that question directly, but it seems pretty clear that they want to see cases on the mainland go way down, um, and even our daily average go down. I mean, what, the one message from this pretty extensive survey is people are still very scared. You know, were you surprised, though, considering the economic impact and the fact that so many people have lost their jobs or are losing income, were you surprised that there was such an overwhelming response in, in their favor? We really were. We expected a little more pushback, and we didn't see that in the survey. In fact, some of the poorer um, folks were the ones who were the most likely to say, let's wait and, and see these cases go down before we open tourism again. And so it's clear across the board in every economic group, um, it, people are not ready to welcome tourists right now. Yeah, th there's another number, and we're showing it right there. 71% say that they trust government to keep them safe. Was that surprising at all? It was a little safe. You know, our state government has performed very well. I know some people have had concerns about the communication efforts, mm. but overall they recognize that we have done way better than every state on the mainland. Yeah. Another thing that, that there was no specific data on, it was the opening of the schools. That's coming up August 4th. But you did say there was something in there about the impact of the pandemic and everything going on on their children. What, what was that? That's right. People are really worried about their kids. When we asked, do you think one of your children has been negatively affected by staying home? The vast majority say yes. Um, and in the comments that they were allowed to write, a lot of people said, we hope schools and daycare centers open. I can't go back to work, and I'm really worried about how this is affecting my children. Okay, so I, and I don't want to read too much into this. So, so does that mean there wasn't as much concern about safety when schools do reopen or was there just a lot of trust within school officials and the superintendent? You know, I think, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, okay. I think people are nervous about schools opening, but they also don't know what's going to happen with their kids, how they're going to go back to work. They're worried about their kids' um, educational progress. So this is just an incredibly difficult position everyone finds themselves in. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody can empathize with that as yeah. well. Anything else that stood out from this study? You know, I mean, overall, I think the, um, you know, you know it, it, it was pretty clear that if we had to make a choice between getting the economy started and staying safe, people overwhelmingly want to stay safe. We've got some other developments we want to get to from across the nation and around the globe. Florida has surpassed its one-day record for coronavirus deaths amid rising fears of a resurgent pandemic. The 132 new deaths pushed the state's seven-day average to more than double what it was two weeks ago. Now across the Atlantic, Britain and France announced they will require people to wear face masks in indoor public spaces. And one more quick international update. In Australia, one state there is threatening to jail anyone caught 
violating quarantines. Congressman Ed Case says he's working with the FAA on the state's pre-travel testing program. This morning he spoke to us about that and the state's plan to push back the reopening. I don't think the governor had any practical choice on it. It was exactly the right thing to do from a public health perspective. And given this incredible second spike across the country, it only reinforces what we've known all along, which is that this is a public health crisis and it has to be solved by public health crisis response measures. And if you try to pretend otherwise, if you open too early, um, you're gonna be exactly where many, many states in, in the rest of our country are. Now there's a new study out that says that women have been hit especially hard by the social impacts of the pandemic, especially working moms. Michelle Medina has more on that new at noon. T Lopez has been in entertainment for 20 years as a singer, Bye. TV host, and now podcaster. Put your shoes on. But when the coronavirus hit and schools closed, the mother of two added teacher to her duties. F? Yes. We've just all got to survive, and that's what I feel like it's been. It's been survival mode. Her husband also has a full-time job, and they're expecting another child. Keeping up with her own job during the pandemic got a lot harder. There were times when I would wait until they went to sleep, but then I'm exhausted <laughs> trying to work. A USC study finds she's not alone. One in three working moms reported being the main caregiver in a two-parent household. That's compared to one in 10 working fathers. I was not surprised to see that women were doing more of the care. Study author and working mom Hema Zamoro found women were also more likely to lose jobs during the pandemic. Female employment dropped 13 percentage points between March and early April, compared to 10 percentage points for men. Once women leave the labor force, it's very hard to come back. The majority of women surveyed also reported reducing their work hours to take care of their kids. With the stress of juggling it all, there's a rise in depression and anxiety. I think in this quarantine time, I've given myself more permission to just, I can't do it today. Check, check. Lopez is taking it one day at a time. She's still working from home, but is focusing on the quality time she gets with her daughters I was in there. as she prepares for the family's new edition. Nishal Medina, CBS News, Los Angeles. Shout out to all the moms out there, really. And the working dads, too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Going to switch gears here just a little bit, take you outside and get a check of the weather. It is now 82 degrees and the time is 1217. Here's Guy Hoggy with your weather. How's it on this Tuesday? I'm Guy Hagi with your HawaiiNewsNow.com forecast. You can see a fair bit of showers out there this morning. Very damp for many windward areas, but we're expecting drier conditions by the afternoon, if not a little bit later than that. And the trade winds will be running at moderate speeds today, slower than yesterday, but they'll be stronger than they will be tomorrow because tomorrow the winds are going to back down even more. It's going to be especially uh, windiest over in Maui County. Otherwise, we can see a typical trade and weather day. Damp in the morning, drier in the afternoon, high temperatures running to near 90 degrees, and those trade winds running 10 to 20. Again, slower winds are on the way by tomorrow. Now, as far as the surface, it's going to be small everywhere. Bigger tomorrow for east shores as a swell that was generated by Tropical Storm Christina starts to move in. It's not going to be that big, but it's going to be an improvement over that. And uh, two to three in town, that might be uh, an optimistic uh, you know, forecast. But it's going to be small, and the box jellyfish likely swimming in for the next couple of days. So heads up on that. So again, uh, a little damp today, drier conditions with lighter winds Wednesday and Thursday. Those light winds continue on Friday, although we're expecting an increase in showers. Keep it here on Hawaii News Now. We'll have all your severe weather updates. Thanks, Guy. I'll watch out for those jellyfish. <laughs> all right, guys, time for from the feeds. Here's what I found. You know, the NFL is set to test out these. Let me show them to you. And for our podcast listeners, I'll do my best to describe them. They're these new mouse shields meant to prevent the spread of the virus. Okay. So the players are supposed to start testing these out next week, actually. It's designed by Oakley, you know, the sunglasses mm -hmm. brand. And they're just placed, it's sort of a plastic glass-like shield placed behind it. There is some ventilation, I'm told, but I was talking to Ian, our executive producer who used to play college football, and he used to wear a uh, visor shield, somewhat similar, but not quite as big, and he was saying how hot it was. I can imagine. How hard it was to breathe, and think about how much oxygen you're using 
and how that would prevent that. Right, and I'm sure it fogs up too, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I wear my glasses mm -hmm. and I have my mask on, whew, I need wipers. Well, we'll see how that goes. All right, guys. This What's is up what next? I found. So the rock continues to highlight front light workers. Check this out. You inspire me. You truly do. And I thank you. I thank you again from the bottom of my heart. We're going to do everything that we possibly can to be disciplined, to be diligent and responsible during this time, doing everything that we could do um, in support of you. And that means wearing our mask, practice social distancing, and again, doing everything that we can. Yep, we love our frontline workers. Now, in addition to pushing for safe practices, Dwayne Johnson donated over 700,000 bottles Whoa. of water to healthcare workers across the country. I know what the next story is about. I'm glad you didn't say gin. <laughs> right, Jonathan loves royal news, so forget drinking tea. Britain's Buckingham Palace is launching its own brand of gin. Now, gin is a hugely popular spirit in Britain, and key ingredients for the London dry gin actually come from Queen Elizabeth's very own backyard garden at the palace. Okay. Now, this one is infused with citrus and herbal botanicals, several plucked from the palace's garden. A bottle will cost you about $50. Not a gin drinker. Me neither. Uh, it's a pretty bottle though. I was just going to say the same thing. Bottle, <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> and a pub owner in England, he's found a way to, uh, to shock some uh, let me start this again. A pub <laughs> owner in England has devised a shocking method to enforce social distancing at his bar by installing an electric fence. Now, at the Star Inn, if drinkers become too comfortable, they're at risk of getting an electric shock. Now, despite early concerns from his insurance broker, yeah. the pub owner has assured us that the fence is legal and as long as there is a warning sign attached to it. However, he has admitted, though, that he has not switched the fence on yet. I don't think that's legal. I think that's assault. Like, that would hurt. No, thank you. Well, if you're you. not following the rules, <laughs> yeah. that's your that consequence. And then another thing we found, Snapchat appears to be gearing up to challenge TikTok. It's testing a new feature allowing users to move through Snapchat's public content by swiping up or down, something that TikTok made popular. The test is focused on content posted directly to Snapchat Discover and not your friend's private stories. This means nothing to me because I'm not on TikTok, so I don't really understand what this is saying. I have an but account, never used <laughs> The timing is interesting though because the Trump administration is currently threatening to ban TikTok because of its ties to China and worries uh, that Americans' private data will end up in the hands of the Chinese government. So much social media I stuff know. to keep up with. Oh so my goodness. Controversy. And I don't know if we're clairvoyant or something, Jonathan, know, but we, we brought this, this up yesterday and now it's a story today. But we broke the news on this is now, I think like a couple weeks ago, about the baby lemurs at the Honolulu Zoo. Well, today they officially announced the names that we told you about. It's Mel after local comedian Mel Kabang and Frank the lemur after Frank the Lima. And Frank's known for making his jingles, so we mm -hmm. had to ask him. We played one yesterday, you know, about what mask wearing. So we had to ask him, is there a lemur song in the works? Here's what he said. I gotta think of a, you know, a song, and then uh, it, it sounds like lemur, and then we'll do it. My twin, the lemur, and um, Kabang, uh, is this amazing that uh, towards the ending of our careers, Mel and I, well not my career, but his career, he and I went uh, on the road, and uh, he, he was a tremendous comedian, and uh, so uh, to be, his brother in that family uh, is awesome. So cute. I love those things. If you haven't gone and seen them, you guys, go check them out at the zoo. They're on exhibit now, and they're so playful and so curious. I couldn't believe how adorable they really yeah. are. Actually, they're a star of the zoo if you make it over there. You guys, that's going to do it for This Is Now on this Tuesday. We're going to be providing you updates all afternoon long on our h and digital platforms. Just a few seconds to remind you, we also do a podcast called This Is Now. Find it anywhere you find your podcasts. You guys have a great and safe afternoon. We'll be back here tomorrow. Aloha. Take care.